My good friend Bobby Shuler is coming up next. I hope you'll stay tuned in. You'll be inspired, encouraged. Bobby is a great minister. He pastors a great church in Orange County, the Shepherd's Grove. I hope you'll stop by sometime. He'll help you become everything God's created you to be. You know, if you live in the Orange County area, we'd love to meet you. We have a great church. It's really a community of joy. If you've got kids and you want to teach them the things of God, bring them out to Shepherd's Grove. We'd love to see you. And as always, God loves you and so do we. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving as we say this confession together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. You know, we say that every week, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me. I want to begin today by encouraging you that I believe you are learning to become the kind of person that really is letting those things go. It's hard not to hold on to our reputation, to hold on to all the things that we think matter to us. Sometimes it's money or our jobs when maybe they've been lost, but we just still are not letting go, or maybe of our past or of tomorrow, you are becoming the kind of person who is letting go of the many burdens that are pulling you down and keeping you from fulfilling what God has called you to do. So some of you came today and you're like, why did they play Let It Go in church with Alex Boyer? By the way, Natalie, our very own Natalie Leonard sang that song. Natalie, it's so great to have you in the house. (laughs) Wonderful. And the reason uh, I asked Alex and Natalie to do this for us was because today's sermon, believe it or not, is called Letting It Go in the Kingdom of God. And I wanted to begin with the movie Frozen and the success of this song. How many of you have seen Frozen? Just raise your hand. So everybody. And uh, if you have a four-year-old daughter, you've seen it a hundred (laughs) times. You know, the story Frozen was a huge success because it was a story about a a princess, a queen, who has this gift that she thinks is a curse. And it's the, uh, you know, this magical powers to, it's a fairy tale, to control snow and etc. And because she thinks it's a curse, she locks herself away in a castle and she's always afraid, always trying to control what people see. So she's, she finds herself more separated and isolated from people. Finally, when the truth about who she is comes out, she runs away, and then there's this amazing moment where she's like walking through the mountains, and she's, you know, she builds a castle with ice, and she makes a little snowman who is adorable. And she's doing all of this stuff, you know, with her magical powers or whatever, and she's, it's Adina Menzel, who's a you know, famous performer from Rent and Wicked, and she's singing this song, and of course this princess, you know, her hair comes down, and she makes this new dress, and she's just like this big... And everybody loves it because she's singing Let It Go in the sense of I'm letting go of of all of my worries of always trying to control how people see me. And it's it's like this freedom song. And I guess what I want to ask is why was that song resonating so much with so many people? Why do you think? I think it's because the opposite is true, that, that instead of letting it go, all of us are like constantly trying to hold on to so much, and many of us feel so tired. If we were to actually let it go, our fingers would creak as we sort of, you know, our spiritual fingers would creak as we sort of unfolded our hands and released whatever the worry is it is. We're so used to worrying that we'd feel awkward to let it go. And the big question I have for everyone is, why haven't you let it go? And I think the answer is, for most people that don't have a faith, how can I let it go if I don't have someone to let it go to? And that is the crux of today's message. I want you to know that when you release the burdens in your life to God, he is strong enough to hold them and sustain them. All the things that you're worried about, your kids, 
your job, all the outcomes that you're trying to control. Let me tell you, work hard, do your best, dream big, but in the end, abandon those outcomes to God. He has your best in mind, and your best future is ahead as long as you don't give up. So just let go and enjoy today. You can smile and stop worrying about tomorrow and stop worrying about yesterday. And you are, you are the kind of person who is building into you a trust, a deep trust in the goodness of God. And you're slowly learning to let go of these things. And because of it, you're becoming a happier person. And that's very good news. You see, all of the Christian journey, most of it is about simply letting go. To become a Christian, you let go of your self-righteousness and you let go of your past. And you let go so that the hands of a loving father can save you. You let go of your sin so that you can inherit something new. And most of the Christian journey is letting go of the things we thought were so important to us so that we can inherit the things of heaven today. You are letting go, and that's great. There is this story I never forgot that was always so sad to me. It was a story of, of how Indians used to catch monkeys. Basically what they do, and my dad told me this story, basically what they do is they take a coconut and they would cut a hole just big enough um, so that a monkey could put his hand in, and they'd put a little jewel or a piece of glass in there. And then they would tie the coconut down to a tree or something. And so what would happen is the monkey would look inside the coconut, and it would see this little piece of glass or a little piece of jewel, and it could make its hand go like this, and it would take its hand and stick it through that little hole. And then when it grabs the piece of jewel, the hand makes a fist, making the fist too wide to pull out of the coconut but still refuses to let go of this piece of jewelry to save its own soul. I think the world is a lot like this. Many of us are like this monkey where we, we could escape easily, but we have to let go of this thing that's holding us back, but we just can't bring ourselves to let go and pull our hand out. But you're doing it. You are not like that monkey, and you are not like the world. You are the kind of person that values the things of heaven, and you know that there is no piece of jewelry or anything else that is worth giving up God's best for your life. You're forming into your soul the kind of character that doesn't always have to be tied down to these types of things. God is freeing you. In fact, today I'm proclaiming over you that no longer will you be chained down to these things. Today you're going to release your worry, your burdens, these big, heavy metal weights that you've been carrying. You're going to give them to God and they're going to become balloons. It's going to be just like taking this backpack full of weights and opening it and balloons come out. You're going to be free today in Jesus' name. Daniel 4 is the story from today in our series. And in the story of Daniel 4, it's a, it's a great passage. It's actually about King Nebuchadnezzar, a real historic figure, a mammoth of a man, incredible power. In his day, by far, the wealthiest and most powerful human being alive. The prophet Daniel is in his retinue as a, uh, like a wisdom counselor. And the weird thing about this passage in Daniel chapter 4 is that now Nebuchadnezzar sort of speaks to the audience. So imagine this were a play, and you'd see the play of Daniel unfolding, in which Daniel's the main character. Then all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar, who's doing this, all of a sudden, in theater, they call it breaking the fourth wall. All of a sudden, he turns and faces the audience, and he tells his testimony. So when you read Daniel 4, it's Daniel telling about what happened in his life. And he said, at the end of my reign, I had this dream, and this dream was about a huge tree and this tree was huge, it was, and, and animals would come and find shade under the tree. But then the tree was cut down, and chains were put along the stump. And he said, and I woke up, and I went to my prophet Daniel, and I asked him, what is the meaning of this dream? And Daniel said, oh king, I wish this dream were about someone else. This dream is about you, that although your branches are wide, and although you protect and care for so many in your kingdom, you will be cut down, and you will be put in chains. You will lose your mind, and you'll become like an animal. And Daniel says, until you acknowledge that heaven rules, you will not regain your sanity. Sure enough, weeks go by, and the king says, and I was standing on the walls, and I was looking at all of Babylonia. 
And I said to myself, did I not create this kingdom for my glory and my majesty? And that day the Lord Yahweh struck me down and I became mad. And like an animal, I ravaged in the woods. And he carries on with the story about how he completely lost his mind. Until finally he turned back to the Lord and he said this poem that Hannah read today where he gives glory to God. Uh, very reminiscent of Job's prayer, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, that Lord, all I have is yours. And he says, and when I confessed that Yahweh was king, he restored my whole kingdom. It's a powerful story. And it's an ongoing theme, especially in the Jewish Bible, in the Old Testament, this theme that all power is ultimately God's. And that power only remains in the hands of the powerful as long as they are just. And so it's the promise that God will undo unjust power. And it also is the promise, and it's the lesson, power, all earthly power is temporary. And if you hear anything, hear that. Power is control. Power is influence. And all power that you have in this world, you will someday lose. All power that we have is temporary. Huh? God, though, loves to give power to the wise, to the humble, and to those who trust in him and not in their own power. So the power that God has given you is temporary and it lasts as long as you remain humble and meek and wise and trust in God. And you are humble and you are meek and you are wise. And as you look to build your character instead of power, God will give you more power. If you look for power, you will not get power from God. As you seek character, wisdom, and humility, God will bless you with more power. The power to make a good difference in the world. And that's a promise. So, when we talk today about letting go, and by the way, that song will be stuck in your head for days. (laughs) When we talk today about letting go, letting go in the kingdom of God, I'm not saying quit or give up. Very often it's easy to think, oh, letting go, that means, uh, that means we're supposed to quit. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, do your best, work hard, dream big, but in the end, abandon the outcomes to God. The outcomes are God. Or as Tony Horton from P90X would say, do your best and forget the rest. <laughs> you know, you do your best in your relationships. You do your best in your job. You do your best if you're in ministry. But in the end, stop trying to control and manipulate people and stop trying to control and manipulate outcomes. When you abandon outcomes, you're able to trust that if I did my best but didn't get what I wanted, that God has something better in store for me. And he does. You see, so much of letting go is the posture, as we teach often, the posture of the open hand. When you let go of something in the kingdom of God, you're actually opening your hands to receive something new. In Christianity, we call this the Paschal mystery or the Easter mystery, that in order to receive life, I have to first experience some sort of death in my life. We're so afraid of death and loss that we can't let go of the old things in order that we can inherit the new things God has for us. So for some of us, we're holding on so tight, God is saying, unclench your fists, let go, let go, so that I can give you something new and awesome. I know it hurts. I know it's been hard, but you can trust me. I'm going to take care of you. Friends, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. Your best days are ahead if you simply let go of the outcomes, abandon those outcomes to God, and know that he will come through for you. When you abandon outcomes, you learn to stop being controlling, and you learn to be empowering to others. You are not a controlling person. You are an empowering person. You are the kind of person that sees the best in other people. You're the kind of person that even when you feel afraid about what they might do when you give them freedom, you empower them to be their very best. And because of that, people look to you for leadership and encouragement. And you continue, God bless you, to be the kind of person who lets go of people so that you can empower them and strengthen them. You don't push, you don't control, and you don't manipulate. You're the kind of person who um, empowers people and doesn't control them, and that makes you a better leader. 
Some of the worst leaders in the world are those who always try and micromanage everything. If you've worked for someone like this, you know how horrible it can be when somebody comes in and says the smallest little thing is wrong and this is right, and those types of leaders are holding on to everything tight, but that's not you. You're a good leader because you believe in people and you're not afraid of them messing up because you know that when other people mess up that you'll be there to encourage them to help them be better. People that are not controlling but are empowering are also better friends and you're a terrific friend because you don't try and control your friends. You don't freak out when they don't call you back or text you back. You're letting them go. You want them, you desire a friendship, but you're no longer your worst enemy by constantly being afraid that everybody is abandoning you or leaving you. This is also true in parenting. When you empower your kids and your grandkids, instead of trying to control them, you're able to help them become adults and grow into the person God's called them to do. Now, I've never been a parent of a teenager. I've heard it's, it's easy. But, uh, <laughs> but I was a teenager once. And I know that there's this tricky time in parenting and it probably depends on whether it's a boy or a girl. <laughs> I think there's this time for teenagers around 15, 16, 17, where, you know, as a child, you do have to, you know, you do have to control your kids. You have to discipline your kids. You have to say, this, do this, don't do that. But there comes a point when a teenager is becoming an adult that the parent has to take this very scary move of not controlling and manipulating anymore and moving to a posture of essentially coaching listening, but also really empowering. You have to trust that this person who's becoming an adult can become an adult and can be responsible. And I think that's one of the hardest things that parents sometimes face. So if you're going through that with your teenager, my suggestion is for everyone, and I know I digress here, for every one minute you tell your teenager to do something, supplement it with 10 minutes of listening and start with those 10 minutes. And this is a good rule for leadership in general. I think it was John Maxwell who said the famous cliche, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that is true through the posture of listening. How many teenagers can't stand their parents because their parents don't listen to them? Somebody on Twitter to me said something like, how do I get my teenager to X, Y, and Z? And I was like, you probably just need to start listening to your teenager. Because if you get to the point where you're saying, how do I get somebody to do this? You're asking, how do I manipulate them into doing something they don't want to do. Leaders want to inspire people and form them to desire good things. And you're doing that. You're a good leader, you're a good friend, you're a good parent, you're a good spouse if you're a spouse, and you're good because you've learned that controlling and manipulating is not helping anyone. That empowering and inspiring is the way to live your life with people, and you do that, and that's great. I think so much of the worry, burdens, and sin that we carry in life is based on the deepest psychological need, which is fear of abandonment. All of humanity carries within itself this fear that I'm going to be left alone, I'm going to be outside of the circle, no one's going to care for me. And the reason this fear is so great is because bonding with a loving person is the greatest human need. That's why at Shepherd's Grove, every single Sunday, we begin with bonding with the person of Jesus Christ. And we remember that grace abounds, that in spite of all the, you know, that what I do, what I have, what people say about me, that those things for God don't matter as much. What matters is that I simply trust in him. So I want to say this to everyone. God is your shepherd, and he won't let you go. So we're afraid of letting go, but God won't let you go. This is uh, one of the most famous passages in the Bible, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I want nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know the green pastures is the idea that green pastures are where the sheep go to eat. And if a sheep lies down in green pastures, it's because it's so full, it can't fit any more pasture in its belly. <laughs> So it takes like a nap on this really soft, so God is, it's like saying, God has made me full and he's giving me rest. And it finishes with this wonderful line, surely goodness and everlasting love will follow me all the days of my life 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is for you, 100%. God loves you. He's never abandoned you. He will not let you go. Jesus takes on this symbol of being the good shepherd. He says a good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep, and Jesus did lay his life down for you. And you know what? He continues to lay his life down for you even today. What I mean by that is that he teaches a story about a lost sheep, one sheep that goes, and there's 99 that are in the fold, and he says that shepherd will not stop until he gets that one sheep back into the safety of the fold. No matter where you are in life, you may be in addiction, you maybe have completely lost your faith, maybe you lost all your money, maybe you lost your whole family, God has not given up on you. He's not let go of you. And you can let go of your past and you can soar and receive the shepherding of Jesus Christ. You can trust in him. He will not let you go. He won't. He's your good shepherd. Henry Nowen tells this wonderful story about the trapeze swingers at the circus. And he said he once met with these trapeze swingers, these guys that swing back and forth. And the two most important people are the flyer and the catcher. And the flyer is always the most famous one. He's the guy that goes through the air, you know, 10, 15 feet. Maybe he does a flip in the air. He does this amazing stuff. And he talked to the flyer and the catcher. And he says, you know, the flyer gets all the credit, but the real hero up there is the catcher. He said, you know, for the flyer, you simply have to extend your arms and trust and just close your eyes that this catcher is going to catch you. Henry said to him, he said, so you never want to catch the catcher, right? He said, oh, no. If you try and catch the catcher, you could break his arm. You could mess up the timing. Simply, the flyer needs to let go and extend its arms out and receive the gift of being caught. And that is the message of the gospel. We're trying to force these things to happen. Today, it's time for you to let go so that you can soar through the air. And there is a moment when you fly that is exhilarating when you don't know if someone's going to catch you. The catcher will catch you. You'll be safe. Don't try and catch them. Don't force anything. Just extend those loving arms and our Father in Heaven will catch you. You're going to be okay. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid and you're not afraid. You're brave. You have courage. You're not afraid. That's not who you are. You're brave. You know, you know God has been there for you. You know he's caught you every time, and he will catch you again. It will be okay. Let it go. So, so for those of us that are worried, it ends today. You're not worried anymore. You're at peace, and you're relaxed. And you're not relaxed because you're dumb. You're relaxed because you're strong and you're smart. You know what other people don't know, the power of God in your life. You're no longer worried about your past. Your past does not define you. Your future is whatever it is you want it to be. You can let go of the sin. You can let go of the mistakes. You can let go of the regret and form a new tomorrow in Jesus' name. So let go of the past. You're not worried about the past anymore. And you're not worried about tomorrow. You're not worried about physical needs. You're not worried about whatever sickness is ailing you. You're not even worried about death. You know that God is faithful, even in death, to save us. Hey, you're not worried about tomorrow. You're not worried about the past. And you're not worried about your reputation. So many of us are up late at night because of something somebody said about us. We need to stop worrying about what other people think about us and only think about what God thinks about us. And he thinks the best of you. You don't have to manage your reputation. You're loved by God. You're loved by this church and you're loved by me. You're going to be okay. Great things are in store for you. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Smile today and enjoy every breath and every moment God has given you because it is a gift. And I know you do and I know you will. You'll continue to empower people. You don't need to control people. You'll continue to abandon outcomes and receive the great gift from Jesus Christ. New life every day that you trust in him in Jesus name and so I want to just pray for everyone this morning and if you're here today and maybe you're watching on television and you say I don't have any idea what you're talking about I don't know God I don't know Jesus I want to offer to you the forgiveness of sins 
and new eternal life. Maybe you say, I kind of grew up in church, but I've never made a decision. You know, when I made a decision to follow Jesus, I, I didn't stand up, I didn't go down. I just made a rational decision in my seat. I'm gonna follow Jesus Christ. And so I'm gonna ask you who are watching at home and you who are here in the church, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Maybe hold your hands out like this as a sign of letting go of all this stuff that's bogging down, everything you're angry about, everything you're worried about, everything you're frustrated about, we're gonna just release that and give it to God. I ask that the church and everyone watching on television, that everyone pray this prayer with me. In Jesus' name, I come before you, God. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Equip me for my destiny. Help me to do the next right thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I hope that you're encouraged today. You're doing better than you think. You're getting stronger than you thought you were. You're already so much stronger than you knew. And God has a great week in store for you. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that God loves you just as you are, that he believes in you, and that you have a bright future if you put your trust in him. Here at Shepherd's Grove, we're not just a church that loves people, we actually like people. Hour of Power has a place in my heart because it's always been this safe place that my family could return to. You know, we think you are not a disappointment to God. One thing about the Hour of Power that many people forget is there are so many people that are in hospitals uh, they're in nursing homes. They're in places where they're unable because of physical reasons to, to get out and go to church. They have their own church right there by turning on the television, the Hour of Power. We believe here that you're not what you do, you're not what you have, and you're not what people say about you. We think God is pleased with you. And I believe the Hour of Power does that to so many people, helps them find a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We exist to encourage others and to encourage you. It is such an honor to be in partnership with you as we seek to reach the whole world with the message of God's love and power. Hour of Power with Bobby Schuler exists to encourage people, give them hope when they're suffering, and to remind them that God loves and values them just as they are. We are so excited to see what God is doing through our ministry, and we need you to be a part of that. Today is the day we're asking you to help our ministry reach more people. Become a partner, and for $25 a month, 100 more people will hear and receive the positive message of Jesus Christ. Your partnership is essential to our ministry, and we are so grateful for it. Thank you for helping us share God's love and dignity with the world.